Kelly Davis, your host of the Untold Miracles podcast, and I am so excited today. I am sitting down with the president and CEO of Children's Miracle Network Hospitals, Mr. John Locke. John, thank you so much for taking time to do the podcast today. You're welcome, Kelly. I really am so excited to ask you a bunch of questions that I've never had the opportunity to ask you, and I really want to start out with what your definition of a miracle is. Well, to me, a miracle is something really big, uh, bigger than life, and it's about life. So uh, in in my mind, when we talk about miracles uh, in Children's Miracle Network, these are miracles that are all about life-saving miracles, and they're a big deal. Uh, They're a big deal to the child who's impacted. They're a big deal to the family, but they are something that is remarkable, extraordinary, and and life-changing. Well, I know that you started in your position of CEO or as CEO in 2011, January. So it's been almost six years, six years in your six years with this organization. I would love for you to share with me one of the biggest miracles that you've witnessed. It can be with a child. It can be with a corporate partner. It can be with anything, a miracle that you've witnessed along the way. You know, um, there have been so many of them. I mean, it's hard to put one of them above all the rest. But I think the thing that is amazing to me is that um, all of the folks that are part of the network, so uh, all the many partners, uh, uh, the many hospitals that we work with, that there is just an undying commitment to day in, day out, try to do more and try to do better. And so me for me, over the past six years, the biggest miracle has been every year we continue to raise more money and more awareness for this cause. And that's hard to do in today's world. There are a lot of great charitable causes and opportunities and a lot of things that need fixing and a lot of social uh, uh, causes that are out there. And this is one that continues to grow every single year. And that, to me, has been a, a remarkable miracle. I have witnessed a lot of miracles along the way, big and small, and I know that we share a love for a mutual miracle. Uh, Jacob Mockby, he recently passed away, and he was our champion from Arizona. He was born with spina bifida and had some severe health challenges along the way, but through the amazing care that he received, his quality of life was greatly improved and he was able to be a miracle on the earth. And I know that he inspired you, John. I know you got to yeah, spend yeah. some time with him. And I just feel like that's the impact of what we do. We save kids' lives, but we cre- change the quality of lives for these kids. Yeah, Kelly, and I think you hit it on the head uh, that it's one child at a time. And uh, that's where I think we all get the most emotional and the most impacted. And I remember Jacob. Um, uh, back in 2011, uh, I attended our first, uh, what we call celebration, uh, really our annual meeting, and we do this wonderful medal ceremony with all of the champion kids that represent the U.S. states and Canadian provinces, and um, Jacob was so incredible. Um, I had the opportunity to help uh, stand behind the curtain and really kind of thank and, and greet each of the children as they went on stage, and when Jacob came along, Um, his mother said, why don't you go ahead and push him out? And so I had that opportunity to roll him out on stage to receive his medal. And just the joy that was on his face uh, to be recognized and to be a part of that event just told me how special and how meaningful uh, the work that is being done to really help these kids. And you could tell it came from the heart, not only from Jacob, but from his family too. Well, I know you that you have a photo of you and Jacob in your office, and whenever I see that photo, it reminds me of why we do what we do. We create, or our hospitals create a light inside of these children that would not exist had they not received the life-saving quality care at their local children's hospital. So I would also like to talk to you about the miracle of working at Children's Miracle Network Hospitals. You have a very interesting background. You were the president and CEO of Mrs. Fields. And before that, I think you were with Pizza Hut and a lot of other corporations Mm -hmm. doing amazing work. How did you go from Mrs. Fields and Pizza Hut from corporate America to nonprofit um, helping save kids' lives? How did that happen? Well, that for me was a personal miracle because I never had any design or intention of having a not-for-profit career. I didn't feel that it was something that I would be interested in or was qualified for. And it was ironically 
through a, an executive recruiter that was recruiting the position of CEO a little over six years ago uh, that came in contact with me. And she um, shared the opportunity and said, I think that you would be great for this. And I said, well, I disagree. I don't think, I don't know anything about fundraising. I know nothing about children's hospitals. Uh, I know nothing about not-for-profits. Um, I've been in a for-profit career for 34 years. I love what I'm doing. I don't ever see myself raising money. Um, and I just said, no, I'm, I'm you know, not interested. And uh, she kept calling me and saying, I'm going to go one more time at you again and say, I don't think you understand what this is about. And I was getting really frustrated with her because how many times do I have to say no? And um, she finally said, can I just send you some material? And I said, okay, fine, great. And thinking in my mind, if that'll make you go away, good. And she sent me a packet of materials and, um, and I wasn't really going to look at them uh, very closely. I kind of opened it up and there was a DVD in there and I happened to just stick it into my computer and curious as to what would be on it. And there were a series of miracle stories about the kids and how they had been impacted. And on one level, it was emotionally impactful, um, certainly, and very touching. But uh, I had, what I wasn't expecting was just kind of this, this experience of my life kind of passing before me. And I had this reflection on, wow, for 34 years, I've had a really great career. I've been able to do a lot of great things, but are they really great? Is the world any better off? Um, because of anything that I've done. And it was, you know, not like, what is my legacy? It was just a little bit of shame that, you know, while I've done some things for me personally, I really haven't done much for anybody else. And, and I felt guilty and felt a little bit ashamed. And it was enough to open the door that when the recruiter called again, I said, <laughs> she said, well, and I said, well, you know, honestly, I'm, I got to tell you, I'm mildly interested. And that from there, uh, um, really lit the fuse and the more I explored about the opportunity and the impact that this organization has on kids, I just said, I've got to do this and I want to do this. And six years later, it's been the most satisfying job, the most interesting, the most challenging, the most creative. Um, and the best part is it's not about me. It's really about, it's always about the kids. And um, that makes it very easy to do this, whether it's, you know, Weekends, nights, days, any time, it's just, it's easy to give the time and the energy to this cause. Yeah, I always like to say I have the greatest job on the planet because I work for the greatest organization on the planet. And I really feel that, I feel that way because the leadership is so great. So I want to talk about leadership for a moment and how you view leadership. I know that a couple years ago, you set a very ambitious goal for the organization to raise $1 billion by the year 2022. And I want to talk about, um, your leadership style and how that's been such an impactful goal for the organization. Last year, we raised $378 million. This year, we have a goal to raise- 390 million. 390 million, and it's because of your leadership. So I'd like you to talk about leadership a little bit and how you um, believe the leadership um, factors in to those miracles being able to happen. Sure, so I, um, I'm a big believer in servant leadership. I certainly didn't create that. It's it has been around for a long, long time, and I think very simply servant leadership means um, unselfish leadership. It's about uh, placing yourself at the bottom of the organization chart and seeing yourself when you are in any position of leadership as working and supporting and helping others, not the reverse. They're not there to work and support and help you. You are there to work and support and help them. And the concept of servant leadership to me is something that's very unselfish and, ve and very much about giving. So it works really well with what we're trying to do because we're, we're in the business of giving. And um, it's interesting, the minute you put your own ego aside and what you think is right and what you think is important, um, and I think one of the most important questions to being a great servant leader is, is asking frequently, what do you think? And in asking others, what do you think, um, you typically find the answers. And because uh, what I've learned is great leaders do not have all the answers. They just ask the right questions. So I asked an important question when I started, how much should we raise? We were raising a lot of money back then, $235 million. That seemed like a lot. Was it enough? Was it more than enough? Was it successful? You know, what, what did we need to do? I needed to know the answer to that. So I asked the question, what do you think to as many doctors, nurses, um, hospital administrators, um, fundraisers in 
the children's pediatric space, and the answer I got was sober, sobering. Um, that answer that leadership question was, we need a lot more. We need probably about four times more uh, than we have today to be able to do all that we need to for kids. Well, four times more at $235 million was about a billion, so that created at least a very nice round number, something that was easy to, to remember, something that was easy to focus on. But to me, it was less about the exact money amount and more about a magnitude of change and a magnitude of reaching beyond and doing things that we had not done before. So, um, And that all comes and stems, I think, from not putting your agenda in the, in the front. And I think that's the key to great servant leadership. Well, I think um, knowing a little bit about some of your hobbies, uh, that I think that probably has a large part to do with your leadership style and your ambition and your drive to help us be as our best selves. And I know that you love to road bike and mountain bike. And I know that you have competed in the country's longest one day race, Loda Joe, which starts from goes from Logan, Utah to Jackson Hole, Wyoming. And I know you've won that race many times. I'd like you to tell me about your competition. Like, I know you compete on the weekends, you win a lot of races, but I'd like you to tie in your drive to competing and how that, and your goals there and how that equates over to Children's Miracle Network Hospitals. Yeah, that's a good question. I, um, I enjoy anything where you're able to keep score and, um, and numbers are involved, and not so much on an ego. I like to win as much as anybody else, but what I like about numbers is the opportunity for continuous improvement. And when I race a bicycle, I'm more interested in racing against myself and asking, can I do better than I did last time I did this same race or whatever it is? And having you know, numbers and reference points give me that opportunity to gauge, you know, am I being successful? And I'm able to translate that to what we do. It, 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 it becomes very simple to me once you translate the why we do what we do, which is about the kids and the life-saving uh, care that is made um, available because of the work we do, and translate that very easily to it's about money. And money is a very simple way to keep score. <laughs> and so having milestones, goals, metrics, and information, um, I think helps us to understand how well we're doing. Because sometimes you can become a little too lost in just the why of what you do and become, uh, which is important, and neglect the, um, are we really doing what we need to do to be able to deliver the why? Are we doing the what? As we move forward with this organization, we are almost in our 35th year. We started in 1983. We raised funds for 170 children's hospitals across North America. We treat nearly 11 million children. What are you most excited about for the organization as we move forward? You know, I'm excited by uh, a lot of opportunity, particularly I think our biggest one is uh, awareness. Uh, we know from survey that the majority of Americans and Canadians really don't understand that their children's hospital needs financial support. And as an old marketing guy, whenever there is a gap in awareness or understanding of, um, you know, uh, of a benefit or, in our case, a cause, there's huge opportunity because if you can overcome those awareness levels uh, and have a higher awareness of, of in our case, uh, the need for children's hospitals having financial support, uh, you can raise a lot more money. And so we have some tremendous opportunities to shout and tell the story of why these kids need help and why these hospitals can treat them and help them. And so um, uh, there's thousands of things that we're going to be able to do and work on. So that, uh, that one big thing really energizes me as a means to an end of raising more money for kids. Yes. And I love how we always bring it back to the one individual. I mean, we treat 11 million k kids each year, but it's about the one. And I know one that is near and dear to your heart is Nate Farrell. I'd love for you to tell me about your relationship with Nate Farrell and maybe a little bit about his story. Yeah. So Nate has mitochondrial disease and that uh, is a real handicap for him. Um, he's had, he has been in and out of children's hospitals, uh, Shan's Children's Hospital in Gainesville since birth. And, um, and yet with him and every miracle child that I've come in contact with, these are the most positive, upbeat. They have every reason to say, why me? Why did this happen? You know, why is my quality of life not what the average child? But he is 
the epitome of what I see across all children. He is as positive. You would not even know that he has had the challenges, the surgeries, the medical uh, you know, issues that he has had to struggle with uh, throughout his life so far. But I, I really got to know, he was obviously one of our champion children, and I met him through that. But I really got to know Nate when I first toured Shan's Children's in Gainesville. And um, as I drove into the um, uh, hospital, he was standing outside the hospital waiting to greet me and uh, waving and... I uh, wish our viewers knew what he looked like and could see this adorable child right now meeting you yeah. outside of the hospital. Yeah, he has a thousand kilowatt grin and uh, he's, you know, he's just, he is a character, you know, and he, there he was, excited to have me there, genuinely, not, okay, there's some visiting CEO and you gotta be nice. He, he, he was, re- and he threw his arms around me, gave me a big hug and grabbed me by the hand and said, I'm taking you on a tour of the hospital. Of course, he had a little bit of help, (laughs) but uh, he walked me into the hospital, and throughout the hospital, as we Mm -hmm. would uh, go floor to floor and go around quarters, there were life-size photo cutouts of Nate pointing the way, and uh, which was kind of a nice touch. He says, see, that's me, (laughs) and I'm gonna show you where to go. But he literally, uh, the tour is probably about an hour and a half, and uh, we then had a nice luncheon with the staff, he was there the entire time holding my hand, telling me, uh, I think he was probably about five or six at the time. Probably five, very, yeah. Yeah, very articulately, um, all the things that happened in the hospital, how amazing they are, and why he and all the other kids that were being treated there were so grateful and so benefited by the funds that were being raised. And so since that time over the years, Nate and I have had an opportunity to be involved in a number of events, and we always... Um, you know, we hug each other and, and uh, get caught up every time we meet. And, uh, but he is a constant inspiration to me of, of we all own our own happiness and our own destiny in life. And while his has been challenging and the outcomes are really, really difficult for him, does not phase him. You would not meet somebody more positive, optimistic about the future and happy about today. And it just does not slow him down. Yeah, I've really been inspired by him as I watch him go through some of the challenges that he has when he ends up in the hospital, but he never complains and he still has that smile on his face. But one thing I really love about Nate and admire about him and a lot of children that have been treated at our children's hospitals, not only are they benefiting from this support, they are going out and they are raising money for their local children's hospital. So with Nate, he's done dance marathon after dance marathon and has really helped raise millions of dollars. One of my favorite things that he has done is he stood on the sidewalk with his little violin and opened it up for people to donate so he could raise money for Sean's Children's Hospital. But I would love for you to share a story with me. I've heard you share it a couple of times because there are those kids out there that are raising money and doing so much good. And there's a story that you've shared that I would love for you to share um, with our viewers or about about what about a child? Yeah, that, remember the story that you shared that about a kid that turned around and raised all this money? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah sorry. Yeah, we'll thanks. edit that little thing. Um, and yeah, he's a young man uh, who is um, was treated by Stollery Children's in Edmonton, Canada, and uh, he uh, he has a remarkable story. Again, um, grew up with a pre-existing condition from birth that uh, required a number of operations. And when he was 12 years old, uh, his name is Braden Mole. And so Braden, at age 12, um, as a result of complications of, uh, uh, of all the other medical issues, he had a stroke. And the stroke actually paralyzed half of his body. And he had to overcome the physical handicap of the stroke. And he, he was able to really do a pretty good job, but he is visibly affected both in his walk and in his speech um, by the impact of that. Um, And so you would say, this is a kid who has some real challenges. He has some um, physical challenges. He has some mental challenges that that continue to plague him as well as uh, the condition of, uh, you know, the things that he was born with. And Braden is somebody who um, wanted to give back and raise money. And so I believe he started when he was 17 and started raising money each year uh, for Stollery Children's. And I'd first heard about Braden when I'd heard that he had raised $968,000 in one year. Wow. Now that, as a, that's a huge amount. So I flew up to, uh, to Edmonton and met with him and said, had lunch with him. And um, I was really overcome when I met him because I wasn't 
you know, I wasn't sure what I was going to get. And to see him struggle to get out of the car and to walk into the restaurant where we met, I was just heartbroken. And then as he struggled to try to communicate with me and the challenges, um, I was saying, how did this kid raise almost a million dollars? Um, and I asked him, I said, so Brayden, I am impressed. Wow. What, how did you do this? And he said, well, it's pretty simple. He said, um, first, he said, I set a very big goal. And two, I broke it down into small pieces. And then three, and he said, and now, and he pulled me closer to him. He says, now listen to this. This is important. He said, never, ever accept no for an answer. And the power of his presence, mm-hmm. even as broken and handicapped as it was, to me, I had no doubt why he raised the money. Because you couldn't say no to this young man. Well, he went on and raised over a million the year after that. Um, he's now an employee of Stollery Children's Children's Hospital as in, in their fundraising uh, on their foundation side. Wow, because I had he's, no idea. Yeah, he's the, he's the most successful fundraiser they've ever had. But, you know, he, he gets it. And... Um, he sees big enough. Mm-hmm. Well, it just goes to show the power of one individual to make a huge difference and create a miracle. And it's so easy to go to cmnhospitals.org and donate a dollar or $5 or $10 or whatever that may be. You have the power to um, make huge impact in the world, just that one individual. And I wanna talk about just being committed to a goal. You were very committed to a goal that we had a few years ago. You set a goal for the organization. And if we reached the goal, you were gonna shave your head. I would love for you to share that goal with us and what happened. Well, after starting and and establishing a billion dollar goal, um, uh, we we did really well. I think we raised uh, after uh, that first year, we were able to raise uh, 250 million approximately, which was a nice jump from 235 as a system. And we thought we set what we thought was a really ambitious goal, which was to raise 30 million more. That's over a 10% increase and get to 280 million. So we set that goal for the year 2013, I believe, uh, or 2012. And um, everybody worked really hard. And as we uh, went into the year, it was clear that we were going to be able to to be able to hit that goal. And so I issued a challenge and said, look, actually not thinking that we would be quite this successful. I said, if we raise over 300 million, or if we hit 300 million, I'll shave my head. And I thought I was pretty safe. Uh, It would be remarkable if we just hit that big goal of 280 million. And um, we got down to the end of the year and people started getting excited about the concept of a bald uh, CEO, I guess. (laughs) or the humiliation of having it done in public. But we, <laughs> we raised $301 million, and um, we brought in Great Clips, which is one of our wonderful corporate partners that raises uh, a lot of money for the hospitals. And they sent a stylist, and we, um, we invited the press, and we went down the first floor um, area of our, our office building, and everybody watched as, my, as I unceremoniously had my head shaved. I remember that day very clearly. <laughs> I was freaking out for you. So I'm like, I don't know that I could have. No, I mean, you kept your promise, you kept your commitment, and it was amazing for the organization to watch a leader, you know, keep his word and show us, you know, what it, what that's like to follow through and, and keep a commitment. But more than anything, what a great way to inspire us, you know, to, to work hard to achieve that goal. So I want to talk about, um, really quick, some people might not know you very well. Um, where are you from? I was born in Utah. My parents moved uh, when I was one week old. My dad had just completed his education and got his first job in California. And so I spent some of my growing up years in California. And then we moved back east to New York, New Jersey. And then uh, I finished my high school in Houston, Texas. So I've bopped around the country a little bit. And how long have you been in Utah now? I have been in Utah for 14 years. I came here for the role at uh, Mrs. Fields and um, thank goodness for that, because I don't think I, it, it, it would have led to this opportunity. And I know that you have four cute boys yeah. that live all around the country. M- most of them live fairly close. The, the furthest the son lives down in Las Vegas. So we're all physically close enough that we can get together often. What's something that people just might not know about you? Might not know about me. Um, I know you, you are an avid sports person. You love being outdoors, being on a bike, snowshoeing, whatever it is, challenging, physically challenging things. But what's something that just people wouldn't know about 
our president and CEO. Well, everybody sees me doing all these activities, and they think that I am this really athletic person. And growing up in high school and and in my youth, I didn't do anything physical. I was really? the I was the weakling nerd in high school that was always studying, and and uh, I tried to go out for sports like football and basketball in junior high school. Got cut from every one of them. I had no abilities. No talent, and um, so I was as far on the opposite side of that spectrum of being an athlete as you could possibly go. And so I run into some friends period because I moved around the country. A lot of people that I haven't seen for years, and I'll see them, you know, 30, 40 years later, and they're just kind of shocked because they remember me as the 98-pound weakling who who wouldn't do anything physical, and uh, and now my life is consumed with crazy wild outdoor activity. Wow. Um, tell me about uh, maybe a hidden talent. Um, I am a musician. Really? Uh, I actually went to college on a music scholarship. <laughs> what, um, what kind? I played trumpet. Okay. And um, I guess that fits with the nerdy, uh, you know, kind of, <laughs> you know, I was, that's, that's, that's what I, my extracurricular activities were around. Um, I was in every musical group, orchestra, band, jazz band. Um, it was my life. Uh, growing up and um does that passion still exist yeah well yes and no i mean i haven't done a lot of it and it just Mm -hmm. ironic that you asked that my mom and dad were in town a month ago Mm -hmm. and um i hadn't i hadn't i haven't been playing the trumpet for 40 years but i I, there was this certain trumpet i always wanted when i was in high school my parents could never afford it and i was able to pick one up secondhand you know and it was more a nostalgic thing but i bought it i think off ebay and because uh, it was always this thing I wanted to get. And, and I started picking it up and playing it. My mom was here and I said, and she's a really good piano, a pianist. And I just said, do you remember when we used to go every year and we go to solo ensemble contests? And one year we won the competition together and we were, had worked so hard all year long. You know, we would spend a couple hours every day practicing together. And she said, oh, yeah, that was a great memory. And I said, well, you know, I got a trumpet now. And I said, uh, we have a piano in our home. And I said, and I've got the music. I said, can you still play it? And she said, oh, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. So I drug out the trumpet and the music, and I was really rusty. And she was rusty. And we kind of squawked through a little bit of it. And uh, we had a good laugh, and it was kind of fun to reminisce. Well, the next two days, I was out of town on business. And she, I got back, and my wife, Allison, says, you don't believe this. Your mom has been in there practicing <laughs> all day long. And so she said, can we play again? So... <laughs> I pulled the trumpet out, and um, this time a little bit better than, you know, at least we'd had one practice session. And we went through the whole thing, and obviously not, it wasn't nearly as good as it was 40 years ago, but uh, we played played together, and it was just like, it was just like magical. But um, I'm grateful that I had that, because music is something you can take with you your whole life. So I don't, mm-hmm. you know, I don't participate in playing bands and do things, but... Right. Um, it's given me an appreciation for music. I can sing and and read music, and it's allowed me to be in choirs and do other things as a result of it. But um, I would say most of the staff don't know that. No, <laughs> it's I, definitely a hidden talent that you failed to share. I am with us. a serious musician at my core. Yes. Okay. Wow, that's amazing. Um, I want to talk about really quick the miracle of marriage. Your wife Allison is one of my favorite people on the planet. And you guys have been married how many years? 38 years. What would you say is a key to having a very happy marriage? Because it's kind of a miracle nowadays for marriages to stay together. We never argue. And I don't think that's, I just think that's the way we were born. Mm -hmm. Um, We're both uh, very even keeled emotionally. We don't have Mm -hmm. super high highs or or big lows. And um, we both hate conflict. We hate the tension and uh, the breakup makeup yeah. piece with all that uh, and drama. Uh-huh. And we're, neither one of us are into drama. Yeah. And I think because we're that personality style, mm-hmm. whenever we get angry inside, rather than let it out and, and have to pay the price in the aftermath, yeah. we just, um, you know, we kind of will we'll deal with it. And what we've learned to do is let the emotion settle mm. and not confront it and then later just say, hey, can I just, mm-hmm. can we talk? And so anytime we engage in a disagreement, it's after the emo- you know, after there's no emotion that's part of it. But Allison will say this, we've never in our 38 years, we've never had what I would call the classic argument where voices raised, unbelievable. Ang- angry words have said, wow. and then, 
you know, feelings hurt and then having to apologize. And, and I guess some couples would say that's a cathartic process. But for us, having this ability that we are each other's best friend and I think we genuinely care um, about each other as much or more than we do ourselves, And that hasn't always been the case, but I think it's taken us years and years to really feel that way. And it, um, it, just, it just works. That's so awesome. Well, I like to close the podcast with this question. If you could create three miracles in the world today, what would that look like for you? Well, the first one would be there would be absolutely no pediatric injury or illness. That would put us all out of the job, (laughs) and that would be okay. okay. (laughs) So that would be miracle number one. I would start with that just because we see this every day, and we see the effects of it, and that would be the world would be an automatically better place for that. And then the second, I think, miracle, um, we live in such a world of conflict and hate and disappointment and um and hurt and i would eliminate all that i just i think the world um we will never be perfect people but i think we can treat each other with dignity and kindness and respect and if if we all did that this would we wouldn't have war and we wouldn't have all the all the stuff that goes on that just takes away from the richness of life so that would be a miracle i think that you know that i would like to see now now we're down to a tough one the third yeah, the third miracle yeah, well for me it would be a very selfish one I would see my four sons you know um be able to achieve all their dreams and be able to have a life that they would be able to look back on and feel good about and feel happy and um you know as a parent you you internalize yourself to your children and you really don't control their decisions and their the outcome but you want the best for them and and so i would a personal miracle would be for my kids to, you know, to be able to to do well. Well, I just want to thank you, John, so much for taking the time to do the podcast today. And I want to thank you personally for your leadership, for your passion, for your vision, for your excitement to come to work every day, because that trickles down and it makes us all want to be the best at our jobs. So thank you. And I hope you guys all tune in to the next podcast and have an amazing day. Thanks so much for tuning into this week's episode of Untold Miracles. To support your local children's hospital and create a miracle in your community, go to cmnh.co forward slash untold miracles to help create a miracle in your community today. $1, $5, $10, all the money stays local to help kids in your community. And if you enjoyed this episode, text love CMNH to 51555 to let us know and subscribe for more.